Welcome to Hail Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hail Varsity and at Schmidt underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmidt. Welcome to it. Great to be with you on a Tuesday. It's Hale Var City Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. Hope you had a great fourth with family and friends. And maybe you're off today or you're back at it. Uh, we'll get you through that post-holiday sludge. We'll check in with our favorite uh, NFL lineman and uh, former Viking. We say hi to Jeremiah Searles in one hour. Mr. Blackshirt. Charlie McBride, I think World War III happened in the McBride cabin as Coach was cleaning up some fireworks. So we'll talk with Coach McBride at 525. And in about 20 minutes, uh, we'll get the recruiting rundown. Mitch Sherman from The Athletic going to join us. Some great coverage as well on HailVarsity.com because uh, it's a flurry, man. It's this time of year, a lot of us growing up would would go to a fishing hole, right? That special fishing hole and. This was the double secret fishing hole Grandpa would always have out in western Nebraska and McCook. And uh, no doubt, my brother and I would fish three times a year, and we sucked as fishermen. Uh, but uh, Grandpa would find the spot. There you go. Drop it in, and you're just reeling him in. He's taking him off the, the hook and putting him, uh, you know, in the cooler. Uh, you're, just, you're catching fish as fast as you can breathe. And that's what the recruiting feels like right now for Mickey Joseph in Nebraska at the wide receiver position. Big commitment coming up uh, with linebacker Dylan Rogers in less than an hour. Uh, Elijah Herbal has his crystal ball out, and it says what? It's not a magic eight ball. It's the Elijah Herbal crystal ball. Oh, it says Nebraska. Why? I don't doubt you, but I'm saying give me your reason. Your reason is pretty solid, actually. You're reading some tea leaves. Yeah, I'm reading some tea leaves here. If you, if you go check out his Twitter page, uh, what's interesting to see here, uh, two things. Dylan Rogers, linebacker, Texas. Okay, you, you look at his Twitter page, and his pinned tweet, the ones at the top of his profile, is the offer he got from Nebraska, mm-hmm. which obviously, I mean, you, you, you want to cater towards Nebraska fans. Uh, but then you also combine that with the fact that earlier today, Brian Applewhite, in the wake of this Omarion Miller commitment, mm-hmm. tweeted, go Big Red. Who's next? And Texas is his territory. Yes. I think he's talking very specifically to somebody who is uh, going to be committing down in Texas in about an hour. So uh, the Elijah Herbal Crystal Ball is in. It says Nebraska with <laughs> 90% confidence. There we go. There we go. Nebraska has to beat out Texas pretty much mm-hmm. for him. Uh, there's some other school, some good schools. I think Arkansas is in there as well. But, uh, you know, another uh, feather potentially in the cap for, for Brian Applewhite. And to further read into the tea leaves a little bit, his last visit was Texas. Mm-hmm. That was the last one he made before his commitment, and usually that's a sign. However, a He would have committed then. I'll, he would have committed then, A. B, a lot more Twitter posts about Nebraska and his recruitment with Nebraska than, than Texas. And you can't read too far into that because sometimes people are just trying to, you know, get their following up, get their name out there, and Nebraska fans are a great, great way to do that. They're very loyal on Twitter. But... Texas fans are the same way, and he's not making uh, the same kind of uh, statements and whatnot about Texas that he's making about Nebraska. Nebraska getting a yes over the weekend from uh, wideout Barry Jackson. Uh, Jackson is in, and one of the, uh, the I think it was the, the initial Friday Night Lights weekend, you had uh, a trio of receivers, right? You had uh, Barry Jackson, you had O'Marion Miller, you had Malachi Coleman all posing and posting together. Well, two out of three ain't bad. You want three out of three, and that's Malachi Coleman uh, that still uh, is out there for Nebraska to try and get. But you get O'Marion Miller. He made his announcement a little earlier today. You couple that with Barry Jackson, and it's been a great Fourth of July weekend for Mickey Joseph. Uh, a lot of hard work and effort going in by Nebraska's uh, associate head coach and wide receiver coach, passing game coordinator. But it comes down when you hear the quotes and see the quotes from Barry Jackson and O'Mary and Miller. It's uh, about Mickey Joseph. It's about the connection they had with Mickey Joseph. It's 
it's really keeping it real. You hear that and you're like, okay, well, in this instance, you uh, you look at Mickey Joseph, you look at what he's produced, and you look at his mentality towards his guys, his drive towards his guys, the no-nonsense BS, straightforward truth serum that Mickey Joseph always provides his guys. He's encouraging. He's an ear for them. I mean, a lot of the guys, most of the guys he's uh, picked up for Nebraska are are dudes that are traveling quite a ways from home. But there's that Louisiana connection or Southern connection with Mickey Joseph, and, and he ain't going to BS you. He ain't going to baby you. And uh, if you're going to play for him, he is going to demand a lot. But if you put that in, it'll more times than not, it'll turn out off the field for sure. And uh, his track record of on the field is pretty good. Uh, with you look at what he did at LSU, and I don't know about you, but I'm anxious to see the Nebraska wideouts do some work. I'm anxious to see the Nebraska returners do some work. And uh, you have Barry Jackson and O'Marion Miller in. A couple of thoughts, first and foremost, on, on Barry Jackson. He's 5'11", 175. The Saturday commitment for Nebraska uh, Jackson out of Atlanta, or the uh, I should say the state of Georgia, and he is he's really gifted in 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 the following. First and foremost, uh, his high school coach just touched on the fact that he's uh, very very elusive. You want that? You want the guy that's got some shake and bake after the catch in space, uh, in the slot, or on a on an out route. You you love that that out route or the, the the post or the hitch with a with a shorter guy, not six two, not Randy Moss guy, but think of well, think of your chase type body type, okay? Where yeah, give me eight for second and two or move the sticks, get me a first down. But in a lot of instances, the you you turn a simple play into a touchdown, okay? When you get a guy that's super elusive, makes the offense go a lot better, doesn't it? Uh, where a guy can turn and burn after catch it in space. So first and foremost, you have good hands. You've got a uh, high level of elusiveness, and you've got an explosive player. This is not a comp. I am not saying Nebraska just recruited the next Tariq Hill. No. He's in his own world when it comes to, to speed, uh, agility, in space movement, and acceleration. But that's your example I'm trying to paint for you is you get a guy that's elusive in space, it can be really good things. And I, I, I'm going to go with a, a slightly different comp here for Barry I'm, Jackson. I, I'm not calling him. Yeah, I know. I know. And, and, and the guy I really look at as almost identical in terms of athleticism and, and what he looked like coming out of high school, Jahan Dotson from Penn State. Oh, he, cool. he ended up working nice. his way into a, a first-round wide receiver. He's with uh, Washington, I believe now. Dotson's only 5'11". Dotson's 5'11". Get this. He looked, he played bigger, didn't he? Played bigger, but he's 5'11". Jahan Dotson's best 100-meter time in high school was 11.07. Which as, is still really good. As for Barry Jackson, 11.18. Very mm-hmm. comparable top-end mm-hmm. speeds. Uh, that route running looks pretty similar. The, the type of things they're going to be doing in an offense look similar. Uh, what Jahan Dotson has that I'm not sure uh, Barry Jackson has just yet is that high jump leaping ability. <laughs> Barry, Go high point it. Yeah, Barry, he's got great numbers in long jump and whatnot in high school. Um, I haven't seen him go out there and do a vertical jump, so I'll, I'll throw that out sure. there. But from what I see from high school, film, I'm not sure it's there yet. But Jahan Dotson, I feel like, is a very, very reasonable comp for, for Barry Jackson, at least as an athlete coming out of high school. You look at Jackson. Thanks for that input. That's good stuff with the, the Dotson comp. Uh, as an athlete, too, with Jackson, we'll get to Miller in a moment. Today's commit. He can play slot, he can go outside, he can play in the backfield. And Nebraska's got a, a really good problem right now. Uh, there's a, a supply of very high-level high school wide receivers. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a demand for Nebraska, and, and right now, uh, how many spots are left? Because you can only take so many wide receivers uh, for this upcoming class. But explosive player can take the, the top off a of defense uh, really good get in Barry Jackson. On paper, you have O'Marion Miller that is similar to guys uh, that, that Nebraska, some flashed, some produced really well. 
I mean, think of uh, a high four-star prospect out of Louisiana. That's what Miller is. And from an on-paper standpoint, uh, he's right in that Wandale, Stanley Morgan, Xavier Betts mold, specifically Betts and Robinson. They were high, high-level recruits, mm-hmm. right? Betts, they were they – I would say Betts is the one that I, I really think of when I look at O'Mary and Miller. Just State. because of the body type and the speed and how graceful and, yes. and athletic uh, he is. And he's a, he's a top 100 recruit. And uh, you have him committed to LSU, decommitted to LSU, and chose Nebraska today over uh, Arkansas, Tennessee, Oregon, and LSU. He still had that that committable offer to LSU. The thing that's interesting about O'Mary and Miller is just the, the competition level he plays at. And he plays in a smaller class in Louisiana. That isn't his fault. And uh, you have that as maybe a turnoff. Well, he's not doing it in New Orleans. Well, Mickey Joseph can tell a dude uh, whether he's playing C-ball, B-ball, or A-ball. And you've got a kid in Miller averaging 125 yards a game, 20 touchdowns, and uh, about uh, 20 yards a a catch. So he is as good as advertised every time he's gone out. It's one thing to do it against smaller competition. And and this is not a knock, but think of the numbers Scott Frost put up. Think 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 of how incredible Scott Frost was at Wood River, right? Well, that didn't stop Nebraska, didn't stop Stanford, didn't stop the who's who. The, the kid can ball, then I don't care who he's playing. And you have, uh, you have to figure every defense that Miller has seen by week two a year ago. It's like, hey, guess what? Let's put all 11 defenders around him. He's been the game plan for every defense in high school, at least last year, and more so going into a senior season. He still produced. He still put up. And uh, that is to his credit. You have him now along uh, with Trey Palmer, Dakotas Crawford. So you've got the Louisiana feel along with your position coach from down home. And uh, that's, uh, that's pretty good. Uh, good. Good job by Mickey Joseph. Nebraska fans uh, really smiling there. And uh, you have the, a good problem right now for Nebraska and that is a lot of guys that want to come to Lincoln and play wide receiver for Mickey Joseph. Got to think you got at least one spot left for, for Malachi Coleman. You do. I mean, Because we were talking about Barry Jackson's 40 time and O'Marion's 40 time and what they ran in, in the, the 100. I mean, Malachi Coleman, bigger than Barry Jackson, uh, both height-wise and size-wise, uh, weight-wise, I guess you should say, and he ran almost a full second faster. And, no, Malachi is incredible. Mal- Malachi is an athlete, just ridiculous. So the, don't think that these commitments are Nebraska saying, "Oh, well, we're not going to get Malachi. Let's go get ourselves some other athletes." These guys are still going to work well together. Mm-hmm. Um, but I-, I spent the majority of my show prep time here just finding comps for these guys, and I'm glad you said Xavier Betts with O'Mary and Miller. Uh, we said Jahan Dotson for Barry Jackson. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you go pull up high school highlights from Xavier Betts and put them side by side with O'Mary and Miller. You'll be like, wow, these guys look almost identical. I think Xavier might have a little bit more top end speed, mm-hmm. but the way that both of these guys have speed and they just kind of glide, they don't look like they're actually moving that fast. Their ability to go high point a ball, um, to go win a jump ball in the end zone. Uh, I mean, I don't want to say carbon copy because it's not a carbon copy. No player is identical, but man, do these guys look similar and how they play and just their their body types. Well, Oklahoma on our radar not only because of the the showdown in September. But that's that's a uh, recruiting race for Nebraska with Malachi Coleman. It's Nebraska, it's Oklahoma, it's Michigan. Uh, OU winning a couple of recruiting battles in the linebacker front. Phil Picotti, a uh, really talented inside linebacker, committing to Oklahoma today. You had, of course, Cade McIntyre, Fremont Bergen. McIntyre committing to Oklahoma. So uh, it's an interesting race between uh, two of the two big reds. From uh, from yesteryear, and uh, that's where Nebraska's at, and anxious to see where things shape up. We'll spend some more time with Mitch Sherman here shortly. And, and to look on the bright side of the of the the equation here, Nebraska losing out on both of these guys to Oklahoma. If there's anyone in the country, I think it's okay to lose out to. It's it's uh, uh, Venables. 
because he's a guy, he's shown himself to have an eye for talent, especially at the linebacker position at almost every stop he's ever made. And I know Nebraska was late getting in on the party with Cade McIntyre, but they've been in on Phil Picotti for a while. And whenever Brent Venables is the guy you're going up against and, and losing to in recruiting, there's something that, that to me strikes me as, you know what, it's okay. I understand the, the draw of wanting to go play for Venables. And if Nebraska's trying to get the same guys as Venables, has that same eye for talent, I think that actually means good It's a good peer group to be in. It's a good peer group to be in, despite the fact that you haven't had the best luck against him this recruiting cycle. Uh, Jay tweets in uh, the old uh, boy Jay Saunders from up in Milwaukee. Shout out to you. I know we haven't seen his guys play yet, but can we just build a statue of Mickey Joseph now <laughs> in uh, in commas only partially joking but uh, mickey's been doing it you've got the the level amped up uh, for nebraska but nebraska's done a good job of, of identifying who they want targeting who they want finding and making sure that from a personality standpoint there's a fit and then you have a, a comfort level with these kids that are coming up from the south be it georgia or louisiana with mickey joseph in the wide receiver room. I say let's build a uh, uh, statue for John Cook first. Let's cross that bridge first. That's fine. No, absolutely. <laughs> uh, John Cook deserves several statues. Uh, we will check in with Mitch Sherman and uh, open phones till uh, 5 for you at, at 440. So you can get that uh, to us at 466-3776. Also on Twitter at Schmidt underscore radio at Herbal Essence for Elijah Herbal. Calling all Storm Chasers fans. A team you never get to see is making their way to Werner Park June 7th through the 12th, and that's the Lehigh Valley Iron Pigs. It's the first meeting between the two franchises, and there's plenty going on that week. June 9th is the Chasers Community Celebration for Pride Night, presented by PayPal. June 10th is What If Night, where the Storm Chasers will change their name to the Hogs. A little backstory, that was a previous Omaha team and was a potential name change when the franchise was looking to rebrand. It's a battle of pigs versus hogs. You can't have a name change without new jerseys too. Specialty jerseys will be worn that night. And of course, they'll be autographed and auctioned off. Snag your favorite player June 10th and then run it back on the 11th. It's Salute to Corn Night presented by the Nebraska Corn Board. It's a celebration of all things corn. Corn on the jerseys, corn in the stands. Trust me, this game will be amazing. See you there. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Big thanks for hanging out. Hope you had a great 4th of July. Hale Varsity Radio back with you. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. And we say hi to Mitch Sherman with The Athletic at Mitch Sherman on Twitter. Mitch, you have a good 4th, bud. Thanks for the time. I did. I did. It was um, it was a good weekend. Got a lot of baseball and um, finished it with a Storm Chasers game last night. Saw the Chasers hit nine home runs. I uh, didn't expect to uh, walk into Warner Park and, and see that, but that was really cool. We caught uh, two of them, um, the group that I was with. Oh, so nice. Who, uh, who could imagine that out of 8,500 people in the stadium? It was, it was a good fourth, and that was a good cap to it. How about you? Uh, it, was, it was wonderful. Uh, I got the grill going, uh, did a little pool time, snuck in some golf over the weekend, and was able to monitor Nebraska's recruiting prowess uh, as well over the weekend. Yes or no, did you guys uh, take state, uh, your baseball club? <laughs> uh, we lost to the champs. Okay. Uh, went two and two. So the bracket champs, not like the you know, overall best team in the whole world champs. But uh, they won the last game, and uh, they beat us in the, in the round of eight. Mm. So, no, but hey. It's about the experience, right? And it was a great, it was a great, uh, great six months of of baseball. And I'm re- I'm two days removed or three days removed, and and looking forward to next year. Well, that's that's awesome. Excited that you had a chance to to be a part of it. That was really cool. Uh, Mitch Sherman with us. Had Mitch Sherman on Twitter. Mitch Mickey Joseph's uh, on a run. Uh, if I knew him better, I'd ask him to go to the boats with me. Uh, that's uh, uh, impressive with what he's doing, but but not shocking. Your thoughts here on O'Marion Miller, Nebraska able to land uh, the six two wideout from Louisiana. Yeah, I don't know if it's luck, Chris. It's uh, not. <laughs> <laughs> I think Mickey's been doing this a while, and he definitely has a knack for being able to recruit. And you see him tapping into some of his old minds in 
continuing to bring players from Louisiana. It's not necessarily been a state that Nebraska in recent years has had a lot of success recruiting. Um, there's some history there, mm-hmm. of course, with guys like Mickey Joseph, Reggie Cooper, and others from his era to go way back. But in recent years, um, you know, those those players from that state are generally staying in the SEC and and now, um, at least the top ones, you see a four-star player, a top 100 prospect who was offered by LSU and Arkansas, Miami, and, and South Carolina. Others uh, come commit to Nebraska after a visit about a month ago. You know, and this is just another in a string of um, eye-opening catches that Mickey Joseph has has landed. Um, you know, Trey Palmer is, of course, one of those at the LSU transfer. You have um, Janarian Bonner, uh, the recruit out of Georgia, um, the coldest Crawford, the wide receiver recruit out of uh, Louisiana uh, that we're in. Both of those guys were in the 22 class, and, and that now uh, Miller is the third wideout out of 12 commits in this 23 class, and, and Mickey loomed large with all of them. Mickey's able to identify, target, build that relationship, and A, think a guy can play, but but Mitch, Mick, Mickey's pretty real with the guys mm-hmm. from from the get-go. You, you need to be, but I don't know that in the recruiting game, everyone always is. Right. Uh, talking to him, uh, you get that sense very quick that he has a great understanding, and he, you know he's been doing this a while. He's 54 years old. He played in the 80s and early 90s, so his perspective is is outstanding on what it takes to be a player at this level. He has been uh, at small schools. He's been at the biggest of big schools. LSU in 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 2019 was was one of the greatest runs in college football history from an offensive standpoint. And they were pretty good on defense defense too. That was a complete uh, completely dominant team, and so he's been at the top. And, you know, I think that really resonates, um, as it should, with prospects. The, 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 um, he has mastered the, as you said, Chris, the way to communicate with players. And he understands what to say, um, how to coach them, and um, just essentially how to play that recruiting game. And you see it even now with so much changing in the world of recruiting because of NIL. Uh, Mickey is is evidence that what worked a few years ago, if you're really good at it, it still works today. Um, you know, kids still want to have a connection. And, yes, they're looking for other things, uh, but what he brings to the table, if you pair it with the resources that Nebraska has to offer, um, it is a lethal combination right now. So I'd expect that this is – not the end. Um, with these 12 commits that Nebraska has, Miller being the latest and the most significant, at least the most prominent so mm-hmm. far, I'd expect that this momentum is going to continue. Um, and, and, you know, some of that is going to be dependent on the success that Nebraska has on the field in 2022. Um, but Mickey Joseph is, uh, you know, certainly somebody who's going to do his part to make this a, um, a class that Nebraska can use to build its program from. Mitch, it, it's a position group that Nebraska has not had a, a ton of success in the four-year guy. Uh, you've had mm-hmm. uh, guys come in, uh, but really, I, I look at Stanley Morgan was uh, a guy that, that transcended a couple of different staffs. But man, was he well, really three? <laughs> but he was he was big time. But overall, it's been uh, a little bit more than a one and done, but it's it's been guys that have that have come in, or Nebraska's lost some players at that position group. Yeah, the development piece from high school up to the end of their careers has just been um, really difficult for Nebraska to unlock. Uh, Stanley Morgan was a, a rare case in in recent seasons. Um, we had success. We saw success with. Uh, Samari Toure mm-hmm. last year as a graduate transfer from FCS level Montana. Um, you know, others like Levi Falk have had some success. And then there were players, of course, like Wandale Robinson and um, J.D. Spielman who left the program you know, after having some success because 
you know, they didn't necessarily like the direction that that they were headed. Um, they were asked being asked to do maybe uh, more or they were being asked to do, I would say, responsibilities that were somewhat outside of the, 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 um, you know, the, the, the purview of what they, what their expectations were. There's been a disconnect. Um, is what I'm trying to say for several years with the, the development part of it and what Nebraska has sold in recruiting. You know, I think Mickey has a real chance to, to change that trend and just the work that he has done so far with high school players is a good indicator that you're going to see that in years to come. But, you know, it's not going to all be smooth. Um, just since his, since his arrival, Nebraska has lost a player in Xavier Betts who I think many would have expected and, and believed and hoped was going to be one of those significant success stories as a Bellevue kid who came into the program as a highly rated recruit and – you know, was going to go on and play in the NFL. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's just indicative of, of um, you know, how difficult it is, um, you know, to make it to make, they don't, they don't all work out mm-hmm. and, you know, we'll see, um, you know, if Xavier ever steps on the football field again, but, you know, if he doesn't, uh, Nebraska is going to be in a good place at the wide receiver position because of the work that, that uh, Mickey Joseph is doing on the recruiting trail. Mitch Sherman's with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. And, Mitch, it feels like, I mean, Nebraska's wide receiver struggles have, have dated back to the departure of Coach Keith Williams. And in that time, I think roughly five, six years, uh, I could be wrong on my numbers there, uh, would you say that the, the bigger problem has been identifying talent out of high school or has it been the development of that talent? Um, well, yeah, Williams last year would have been uh, Mike Riley's last year, so we're in year five of Scott Frost. He's been gone that that entire time. And I, I would agree, Elijah, that – Keith Williams was um, an outstanding technical coach, um, a great motivator. When he got guys on campus and you saw it with Spielman, um, he was outstanding at getting the most out of them. Um, and, you know, he's, he's doing his thing in the NFL now. He's worked with notable NFL players, so he was a hit for sure as a wide receiver coach. Since then, it, it's been, I think, different philosophies. Troy Walters had a philosophy with the kind of receivers that, that he, that he liked to recruit. Um, you know, I think he liked to recruit guys who were somewhat like him and he was a Bolitnikoff winner at Stanford. Um, he was an NFL player. He was a successful wide receiver coach when they were at UCF. So his, his, his roadmap, it worked. Um, it didn't work in Nebraska for whatever reason, um, whether it was a Big Ten thing, whether it was um, the something within the program uh, about those players not fitting in. And then, you know, Nebraska's been through a lot mm-hmm. with players at that position. You have the 2020 class where a good portion of it was just doomed from the start uh, because of the pandemic and, you know, just a different environment that they were living in in Lincoln. And <clears throat> there were receivers in that group who never got a chance to play in Nebraska because they were gone before their careers got off the ground. So you know, I don't, it hasn't been one thing. You can't look at it and say, oh, it's identifying talent or, oh, it's, it's entirely about development um, or it's about changing philosophies. Uh, Matt Lubick came and had a different philosophy with receivers than what, than what uh, Walters had. I think Mickey Joseph and, and Mark Whipple have a different philosophy with what they want to do uh, at that position than what Matt, Matt Lubick had. So they need some consistency. And it's only been a few months, but uh, you know, I think Mickey's laying the foundation, it, along with Mark Whipple and Scott Frost, in, in bringing consistency finally to that position. Mitch Sherman's with us. Mitch, about a minute or so uh, with conference realignment, USC, UCLA to the Big Ten. What's your timeline? What's your projection on, on a Notre Dame decision? I don't think it can be years and years down the road, but you know Notre Dame always has leverage. Um, probably not as much as usual right now because of the kind of money that that school could be looking at if they do take that leap and, and join a conference. And there's really only a couple of options that Notre Dame could go. So you know, there's a couple of dates to look at. One, you have the media rights deal with the Big Ten that starts anew a year from now. And then, two, you have the um, 
absorbing of UCLA and USC that's two years from now. So it would make the most sense if Notre Dame is going to do that and end up in the Big Ten for it to happen at one of those times. Um, but I don't know in this situation if what makes the most sense is the thing that's most likely to happen. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the case in general with conference realignment. You know, I could see it three, four, five years down the road, just out of the blue, okay, they're ready to, to, to make that leap. But, um, yeah, I think it would make the, the most sense for everybody if it was either one or two years away. So at least the decision was made then. Yeah, absolutely. Mitch, we'll get caught up again. Great stuff today. Thanks for your time, as always. Okay, thanks. Take care. Calling all soccer fans. Union Omaha is back home after an unbelievable showing in the Lamar Hunt U.S. Open Cup round of 16. An upset over Minnesota United? That's our team. So join them when they come home May 28th for Educational Outreach Night. Presented by Bellevue University. The Owls will face Northern Colorado Hailstorm FC and after a couple of road matches will come back on June 18th to face Greenville Triumph SC. It's also Pride Night. We'll see you there. Chime in 402 466 ESPN or email the show Chris at HaleVarsity.com. Just try me. Try me. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. Coming up, we'll spend some time with Jeremiah Searles. Of course, Tyson's treasure chest, he off for treasures. Coming up also, Searles, part of the Team Jack golf outing this weekend. We're live from Wilderness Ridge, Saturday morning, 7 to 9 a.m., ahead of the Team Jack tee-off. And we'll be out at Woodland Hills uh, a week from Saturday. So a couple of golf roadies, uh, Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, open phones till 5. Then we'll check in with Searles and also spend some time with Coach McBride. Uh, excited this week, too, to run down Coach Kaczynski. Numbers to get in, 466-377-6800-825-5865. So uh, this is on the horizon. We'll have more time to well, parse through it post-interview. But John Canzano, really talented uh, writer and, and radio guy out in Oregon, he is... <laughs> He's going to sit down with the Moose today. Bill Moose is going to make uh, an appearance on his show. And um, that's where Moose will weigh in. Moose, of course, at Nebraska, at Oregon, at Washington State is AD. And it'll be interesting, as Moose has made a comment about the road in the Big Ten. Moose, a longtime Pac-12 guy. And asked about the fact, all right, what is going to likely be the path for USC, UCLA? How will they do when they join the league? And I don't know about you, but I thought Nebraska, because of their speed, the way they were built uh, in the Big 12, I thought they'd come in and run circles around the Big 10. Boy, was I wrong. Now, the speed was pretty solid out of the gate. You had some good teams, some really good players your first couple, three years in the Big Ten. And you weren't awful. You just weren't winning some of the big games. We'll talk with Searles about this. You weren't winning some of the big, you know, the the high-profile games. You weren't really beating Ohio State at at their peak. You didn't beat... Uh, Wisconsin, like you should have. You got embarrassed, frankly, by Wisconsin and and some of the higher profile showdowns. You were right there against a good Sparty squad, but you didn't beat them. But the flip side is, is typically you weren't losing to Purdue. You didn't. You typically weren't losing to Illinois. You didn't. You uh, weren't losing to Iowa, maybe once uh, in the Pelini era. And you did pretty much solid work you were five and three you won in ann arbor you won at college station i mean a couple of times you went three and oh against penn state so it wasn't all bad but those those blowouts were, were tough to take for some of the fans moose goes on to say it ain't gonna be easy and it won't be an easy road for usc and ucla at nebraska we took Teams into Ohio State, into Michigan, into Penn State. Let's just say there aren't going to be any 10-2 and two seasons. 
for UCLA and USC. <laughs> wow. He might be right. Because it is, it is a, you have two years to, to start your transition with what you're going to recruit. I mean, you're going to go get who you're going to go get, and you're going to see if your best can beat the Big Ten's best. What's iconic about Ohio State is, is it doesn't matter who they play. More times than not, they're really good against a Clemson. Either they, they lose by a score or they win the game. Clemson's been right up here. Alabama ripped them apart in 2020. But Ohio State's been really good at whoever they've matched up with. They don't always win. But they're able to, for lack of a better term, play about any style. Penn State built that way. They're not what they were three, four years ago, like knocking on a title door. Wisconsin has done decent. They've done better in their bowl games. They've done better in some of their bigger road games or or non-conference games uh, with their style and athleticism. Iowa seems to hold their own at Kinnick at night for sure. But they've been okay in bowl games. I know the, the, the Rose Bowl against Stanford was really ugly back in 2015. But, you know, they, they beat Florida and they beat a decent Mississippi State team not that long ago. And, and those are bowl games, and I know that's not regular season. So I guess the I think it's going to be problematic for UCLA just because they've always underachieved. And Chip's a really good coach, but it's going to be a steep hill for UCLA to go week in, week out, survive in the Big Ten. It goes back to the line of scrimmage discussion point with Derek Peterson. If, if, you, if USC is back to be at USC, they're going to kill you with a great pass rush, and they're going to be able to run the football. If they, do, if they decide to do that or be able to do that, uh, they'll be fine. And maybe Lincoln Riley's offense will be that good that they'll just high wire act it and good luck covering them. Who I mean, knows? I mean, look at what, what do you think? Do you think they're, they're destined for a, a worn down by seasons and best case 10 and 3? Or do you think they're going to feel what Nebraska felt as they transition into the Big Ten? Because you've got all sorts of styles. You do. I mean, you've got you've got physical power football in Iowa and Wisconsin in Minnesota, where they just beat the hell out of you. You have that, and then you add a lot of skill with Michigan and Ohio State, and then yeah, there's there's Penn State for good measure. And oh yeah, I don't know that Sparty is going to be going away. Not eleven and two, great, but they're going to be an eight nine win program. They could be anyway. Well, look back at the history of Lincoln Riley at Oklahoma. His teams were as good as his quarterback play was. That that was the simple fact of the matter. His running game was good enough. The, the defense he had was, some really was great backs. Good enough. And, and let's not act like the past three, four years of the Big Twelve is what it was six, seven years ago, where it was shootouts, sixty-seven to sixty final scores. That's not what the Big Ten's act, or the Big Twelve, excuse me, has actually been for the past. It's been, three it's been years. a little bit more buttoned up with with Baylor and their defense and Oklahoma TCU State and Oklahoma State's year. defense. Yeah. So, so I think about that and I go, you know what? USC could make the transition to the Big Ten because when I think of a school that. Um, their team plays as well as their quarterback does, that, that kind of reminds me of Ohio State. Ohio State's got more talent surrounding their quarterback than I think uh, Lincoln Riley ever had at Oklahoma, but he could build it up at USC. So I, I could definitely see Lincoln Riley building an, an Ohio State-type program where if he's got that five-star quarterback, put, put some good skill position guys around him, your running game just has to be good enough. And, and that's, what, that's what Ohio State's been for a few years now. Their running game just has to be good enough to keep the defense off balance so they know it's not a pass. Everybody. Well, Ohio State's problem is, is they... They couldn't or they didn't. I think of the Michigan game, first of all. Ohio State's had backs that are really good, but they've wanted to win throwing the football, and that didn't work out well uh, in that snow globe ball game in Ann Arbor. I mean, it just got sideways because you're trying to chuck football around in space. And when Ohio State's been great, they've they've had a, a uh, phenomenal back. I mean, think about the, the the names escaping me, but he's a transfer from Oklahoma. That that oh, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. He ran for three bills against Northwestern. That's how they won the game uh, in the Big Ten title game because uh, Fields didn't have a good throwing day. So we'll uh, jump into this with Searles, uh, the transition from the uh, well from one league to the Big Ten.
And now, and now back to Hale Varsity Radio. One final time, Hale Varsity presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, Jeremiah Searles is going to be with us uh, in just a bit to get his take on expansion. Uh, of course, uh, the fundraisers the next couple of weekends on the golf course. And uh, just uh, some O-line thoughts with uh, Nebraska football. Numbers to dial up, 466-3776-466-3776-800-825-5865. Joel Klatt weighs in uh, on the money, per usual, with the short-term and long-term of the state of college football. And right now, it's uh, it's an issue outside of the SEC or Big Ten Big Ten, uh, long terms for outlook for fans. Big picture is a good one. These times right now are going to shape a better postseason. You'll have playoff expansion. You'll have better non-conference games because it's all going to be positioning for the college football playoff. And I know that's technically what it's supposed to be now, but it's not always treated as such with your non-conference games. And you're going to have a stronger governance. You'll have somebody as the college football czar or a committee come forward of college football people that will be able to call their shots. The Big 12 and Pac-12 right now are figuring out, feeling each other out because the Pac-12 has accelerated their media rights negotiations. Their thinking is if we can be first, mm-mm. And land a a better payday somehow, we'll be able to go pluck who we want from the Big 12. Right now, you have some of the narrative being, okay, you're going to have the the rest of the Pac-12 potentially absorbed by the Big 12. That could be Oregon. That could be Washington. That could be Colorado and Utah. And then Arizona, Arizona State, Stanford and Cal, Oregon State are just still kind of out there. I'm sure I'm missing somebody else, but Washington State mm. is the the other. We'll talk to a proud Cougar. Washington State Cougar, that is. Jim Walden. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Walden gonna be with we us are tomorrow. Not talking to Madonna tomorrow. Right. G- Gentleman Jim. <laughs> Gentleman Jim gonna be with us. Not Madonna. Much to <laughs> Elijah's chagrin. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> I think they could both, both of them could probably kick our butt in push ups. Oh, Madonna wow. and Jim Walton. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I would bet money that Walton would, would do work on the golf course as well. Uh, give us a follow. Find us on Twitter at Schmidt underscore radio. Chris Schmidt, that's me. And uh, for Elijah and Herbal Essence, for Elijah Herbal, uh, do that. Get the podcast. Uh, many thanks to all of you who have subscribed, but tell a buddy, give us a rating, good, bad, or ugly. We want the feedback. We want uh, the review. We're happy to read uh, what you have to say. Spotify, iTunes, and Google Play is uh, where you go to find Hail Varsity Radio six days a week. Uh, do it that way or can log on com. All the on-demand stuff, that is ESPN Lincoln. The interviews you want to hear, the segments you want to check out. Reminder to get buckled up. Uh, Do so. Hands on the wheel, eyes in mind. Straight ahead, the driver has one job to drive. A message from the Nebraska Department of Highway Safety Office. Our favorite NFLer and uh, Viking, Jeremiah Searles, next on Hale Varsity, presented by the Nebraska Rider. Hello, listener. Hey, it's Chris Schmidt with Hale Varsity Radio, and I wanted to let you know about a special deal just for listeners of the Hale Varsity Radio Show podcast. We're offering $10 off the annual subscription price. That means that you can get everything we do. 10 issues of our monthly magazine, our annual football yearbook, and all the premium content we produce at HaleVarsity.com. Just go to HaleVarsity.com backslash subscribe and enter in the promo code GBR for $10 off a full year of Hale Varsity. That's HaleVarsity.com backslash subscribe promo code GBR. 
Welcome to Hail Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hail Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Hour two at Hail Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, as uh, Nebraska, as just as Elijah predicted with the Herbal Crystal Ball, linebacker Dylan Rogers committing to Nebraska, and uh, pretty nice uh, Twitter post from him. Cypress, Texas, is uh, where he hails from. Had interest from Colorado, Houston, K State, Missouri. And he picked uh, Nebraska over Texas. And uh, it was, uh, well, the uh, second home part of things that uh, was the uh, the prom- prom- predominant factor for Rodgers. So Nebraska getting a linebacker uh, uh, as well as a wideout today. Nebraska stays hot. A high-profile recruit that did great work on the football field and off the field for Nebraska. Jeremiah Searles with this. At Searles seventy one underscore HSKR. Searles, how we doing? I'm doing well, man. I'm actually heading up to Minneapolis right now, so I'm driving north here on old I thirty five. But enjoyed a great holiday with the family and a nice weekend, and tried to not melt too much in the heat yesterday. Yeah, I get the uh, the AC going, and uh, was it a, a large fireworks display at the Searles household, or did the neighborhood take care of that for you? Oh, the neighborhood did. You know, I got one of my good friends, neighbors, Bryce Romer. He puts on a great show. Uh, he had it all timed out. He had it all put down and written down and had, like, a guy lighting it. He was, had his little red light on and called the show. And it was about, like, a good 30-minute show. So it was really good. You know, the kids had a ton of fun. I've, just, I've never been a big firework guy. Well, talking to some of your, your friends and teammates on the offensive line, it sounds like Butch may have, may have scarred many of you. Him and Broderick Nickens scarred many of us with the old throw the artillery shell real close and surprise good morning. <laughs> uh, so, so you'll open up a little more on this than than Spencer would. So, yeah, because he was like, yeah, I'm not a fireworks guy. You're not a fireworks guy. That doesn't shock me that, that old Butch Cotton was a fireworks guy. Yeah, I mean – there's a few guys that uh, love to blow things up there. And, you know, I, I actually played against Jason Pierre-Paul the year after he blew his hand off, and I can remember staring at him and being like, that is just disgusting. And so, you know, I just I don't, I don't, I don't light things off anymore. So, so the public service announcement was, was JPP, first off. Uh, 100%. And secondly, in your mind was was uh, old Jake Cotton. That's that's funny. Old Butch, boy. Old Butch. So, buddy, you've got a busy couple of weeks. Tee off for treasures on the the sixteenth. Uh, uh, Tyson's treasure chest. You and, and your family are, are such a big part of that, and that also you're part of the team jack outing this weekend. Searles, uh, folks can donate. Folks can can get signed up. Uh, and I know that for the team, Jack is—is is there still a spot for teams for tee off for treasures in two weeks? Nope, we sold out of that. You know, uh, this is our ninth year doing it. Our first couple of years, we had maybe I don't know, like ten to twenty teams. Uh, this year, we sold out in thirty minutes after we opened it to the public. You know, so we're so thankful to the community um, that we've grown there for Tyson. So that's fully booked up. There is some spaces left for Team Jack. If you want to get in uh, to Wilderness next week, uh, so there's some options to still fill a foursome there or a single golfer or whatever. You can go to teamjack.org slash golf for that one. Um, but Tyson's one's full up, and it's a really we're really excited for it to uh, get it rolling again. That'll be out at Woodland Hills on the 16th and Team Jack at Wilderness here this Saturday. We'll be broadcasting live at both and excited for that. And Searles, this is so near and dear to your heart. Before we get to some football and some realignment stuff, uh, just spend a moment, uh, if you could, on on your your relationship, not only with uh, Tee Off for Treasures, but also Team Jack, and just part of that outreach and, uh, you know, life beyond football that was so big at Nebraska with you and so many. Yeah, you know, it's, it's 
so easy. You know, a lot of people are like, when you have cause, it's because it's really personal to you, you know. And for both these cases, in Jack and in Tyson, I was able to meet both those young those young boys when they were fighting their terrible disease, you know. And one of them had a great ending in Jack being in remission and fighting through it and being able to actually beat it. And then the other one had a horrible ending, and which is more likely in the scenario with what is pediatric brain cancer where Tyson lost his life fighting this disease. You know, so it's, I've seen both sides of it, and it's very personal to me. You know, I think that when you see it firsthand and you get to know not just the kids, but the parents and the support system that is what these families go through, like, you just want to help it even more. And, you know, this year being the first year of the golf outing with Team Jack and no Andy being there, right, mm-hmm. that's going to be a hard one. Like, him and I talked about this doing a golf thing for years. We talked about it because he's a golfer, and, um, for him not to be there is going to be really hard being the inaugural golf outing, you know. So all those things just are so near and dear to my heart, to Emma's heart, and to really all the Husker players that play in these things, help reach out and help start these things, you know. It's, it's just one of those things, that, like you said, it's bigger than football. It's bigger than you and I. Uh, and it's raising battle. It's raising money to really fight a horrible disease. Jeremiah Searles with us, Hale Varsity Radio. Searles, thanks for what you've done and continue to do with Team Jack and, of course, uh, Tee Off for Treasures. Uh, excited uh, to be a part of it again and uh, can, can log on teamjackgolf.org uh, for uh, tea time and, and get a uh, team together for this weekend and can throw your uh, financial support uh, behind uh, Tee Off for Treasures for sure. Uh, and uh, that website posted on uh, different social media outings uh, or, 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 or channels uh, for, for Searles at Searles71 underscore HSKR. You can go there for, for tee off for treasures. Searles going to switch gears to football and thoughts on, on UCLA and USC, specifically how they transition to the Big Ten. What, what was the most difficult part? about Nebraska, your guys' transition to the Big Ten? Yeah, you know, first off, I'm not – I don't know if I'm just because I'm starting to get older in my grumpy age, but I'm not a huge fan of the USC-UCLA joinment of the Big Ten. Um, I think that what we're starting to see is probably a bigger paradigm shift, which is you're seeing more teams join the Big Ten and the SEC because we're not far off from there just being two true conferences in college football. Mm-hmm and teams are going to want to grab a seat at the table before the music stops. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's, it's just kind of a start for me of down a road that's just going to be a really change in the entire landscape, which college football is, which good or bad, whatever it may be. Um, just mixed feelings on that on my end. But, you know, going back to the hardest part of transitioning to the Big Ten is it's going to be your defense. You know, when we came in, we were built to rush the passer and get after Colt McCoy and Brandon Whedon and, guys that were throwing the ball over the yard 40 to 45 times a game. But then you show up and you're like, oh, this is different now. They're going to hand the ball to their running back and they have big downhill 13 personnel, three tight ends on the field. They're going to run power 40 to 50 times a game. You know, you have to really recruit differently than who you bring in on the defensive side of the ball as far as linebackers and defensive line and safety that can fill the run. And that's a big shift for, especially coming from the Pac-12 where, yeah, there's Stanford who runs the ball, but you see them once a year versus a team that you're going to see Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, um, Nebraska, hopefully back to a little more downhill power run game. You know, you're going to see it week in and week out, but it actually is pretty difficult to try and get your defense where it needs to be to stop that every single week. Now, Searles, with the benefit of hindsight, looking back, how close do you think Bo Pliny was to having his team ready to, to go out and compete in a, a Big Ten on a week-to-week basis. I mean, I think we can look at the Mike Riley teams and, and see that stylistically uh, that that vision just did not line up with what was going to work in the Big Ten. But, but Bo Pliny found some success. So when you look back at, at the, your own teams you're on at Nebraska, how, how close was Bo Pliny to getting it right? You know, I think we were really, really close. I mean, the fact that we made it to our first three years in the Big Ten, we made it to two of the conference championship games. I mean, it showed that offensively, we were able to kind of blend the West Coast spread. You know, that was kind of the Tim Beck specialty, the Sean Watson specialty of we still had power schemes, but we were able to still spread guys out. And then defensively, you started to see Bo bring guys in like Vincent Valentine and Malik Collins and Freedom and and those guys that were bigger bodies off the edge. And then 
be able to plug guys in, and you saw him kind of go to the Michael Rose Ivies and the bigger middle linebackers, right? Like, you started to see that kind of trend going in the direction of what the Big Ten was really going to be about. You know, so I think that he got it really close, and, you know, he missed on some guys, too. It's hurt. Um, you know, specifically kind of our O-line, once that 14 Alex Lewis class kind of graduated, there was really not a lot of depth back there, and so I'm not real sure how successful they would have been on offense there um, if Bo even would have stayed because he missed on some recruits there for the offensive line. But, you know, I think he was getting pretty close. Searles, let's look at this year's offensive line and, a lot of moving parts from an injury standpoint uh, with, with Teddy and Turner. And, uh, of course, New Ely is, is done for this year. The, the question mark at center. You've got Hunter Anthony that's a transfer in. You've got Kevin Williams that's a transfer. Lutowski at guard. Uh, Piper and Ben Hart. I mean, let's, let's put everybody in the same uh, beer mug. And is there, is there enough talent and some experience to, to, to make quite a bit of improvement on the line, or is that still a question that, that's out there? How much better can the line be? And I know that there's not any certainty because of, of some key cogs you're A, replacing uh, at center, but B, also the guy's got to come back and come back healthy from injury. Yeah, you, know, you nailed it. You know, and the biggest thing for me is, Losing, losing Nuri is big on the experience front. You know, it's always good when you have young talent out there, and I do think we have quite a bit of young talent from some of the guys you just named. Like, but you don't have kind of the experienced guy out there that's got a full almost year starting under his belt. Then that's kind of like who holds the pieces together when things start going off the rails. You know, you always kind of needed that voice of reason on the line of like, hey, well, let's, let's everyone come back down to earth here and let's regroup. And I'm not real sure who that is now. I mean, is it Ben Hart? Is it Turner? Um, and, you know, who is it? You know, would Teddy need to come back? I think the thing we have to remember about Teddy, too, is going into the year, there's going to be really high expectations for him, which isn't necessarily really fair to him. You know, he's had really a game-and-a-half sample size of what he played. And, you know, he played well against Northwestern. He was doing pretty good against Michigan initially on. You know, but he still has a lot to prove, and he still has a lot to figure out as a young player. So, you know, I think that people are going to think, okay, here comes our savior left tackle. Like, there's still going to be a lot of growing pains with Teddy like next year being his first year starting. We just have to expect that. You know, the thing that really worries me is the center position and the right tackle position. You know, Ben Hart's played two years now. He didn't have a stellar year last year. I mean, this is the way it was. And is it now him? Is it going to be Turner? Who's going to kind of take the step there at right tackle to become solidified? And then really who's going to be the, the controller in between? Is it Hickson? Is it Ethan Piper? Like, I'm not real sure who it's going to be. And as you're going into a fall camp with more questions than answers and three of the uh, top four of the five positions, and that's going to be a really hard thing for Coach Rayola and Frost to kind of decipher as they go through here. So let me get your quick take about Turner and center. Is that is that something we've heard that narrative? Do you, do you think it's doable? I think it is. You know, I think Turner's athletic enough. The thing that if he goes and he makes it into center, I, his strength will need to take it a big jump this winter and summer. Um, to play center in the Big Ten, you got to be a big, strong dude. you got to be able to hold in there and keep that depth of the pocket, not getting pushed underneath. And I mean, quarterbacks, yeah, they hate getting hit around the edge, but they hate not being able to see in front of them because they have their center in their lap, you know. So that would be something for him that he'd have to really work on. I think athletically you can do some really special things with him in there like they did with Jurgens, where you pin him, pull him, you pull him out on the edge of pass protection, you get him out there on screens. because He is a really good athlete. So, you know, there's a lot of upside there. But, again, if you're talking about a full position change with a guy that came off an injury uh, last year, didn't have a full spring ball that maybe make that transition and really first live contact reps at center would become fall camp right before the season starts. That's a hard thing to ask of a guy, but he's also young enough that he might be able to pick it up rather quickly. Searles, real quick, about 90 seconds on chemistry. When we talk about a tight-knit football team, you guys had that. Where did that come from? Was that the lines of scrimmage? Was it the quarterback? I know it can vary, but where did where did that voice folks respected uh, come from? Was it was it a skill or was it a trench guy? You know, it's it, it, to be honest with you, it comes from the top. It comes from the head man. You know, it comes from the head ball coach. That's where your culture starts. That's where the chemistry starts. And that's where you kind of base everything out of there. And then from there it goes to 
um, your kind of your positional room. And I you know for us, it always was kind of our class. You know, we were an old, we had a lot of young guys that started early. And so me, Spencer, Brent, Cole Pensick, Spencer, like we were kind of the voice of reason in that old line room and really the entire offense there towards the end. That was the chemistry and building together and all of that. You know, so that's really where it kind of came from. But it all starts with the head ball coach. Jeremiah Searles with us, Hale Varsity Radio. Uh, be sure to uh, get in touch with Searles about ways to donate uh, to Tee Off to Treasures, Tee Off for Treasures, that is at Woodland Hills at uh, Golf Tournament. Uh, incredible, the ninth annual that uh, Jeremiah and his family are so uh, involved with and a uh, way to, to fight back and donate against pediatric brain cancer. Team Jack outing is Saturday at Wilderness Ridge. You can log on Team Jack and find out a way to get a team signed up. Uh, maybe you want to go swing the clubs this Saturday and a, gate w- a great way to, uh, to to raise funds. Again, fighting pediatric brain cancer. Team Jack and Tee Off for Treasures uh, back-to-back weekends. Searles, safe travels, brother. We'll see you on Saturday. Thanks so much. Absolutely appreciate it, guys. Go Big Red. There he is, Jeremiah Searles, with us here at Hale Varsity Radio. And uh, find him on Twitter at Searles71 underscore HSKR. Another recruiting win for Nebraska. We'll talk linebackers. Coach McBride next. It's Hale Varsity. We're presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Pardon the interruption, but I'd like to save you some money. I'm Brandon Vogel, Managing Editor of Hale Varsity. And I wanted to offer listeners of this podcast $10 off the price of an annual subscription. That means that you can get everything we produce. 10 issues of our monthly magazine, our annual football yearbook, and all of the premium content we produce at HaleVarsity.com. Just go to HaleVarsity.com slash subscribe and enter the promo code GBR for $10 off a full year of Hale Varsity. That's HaleVarsity.com slash subscribe, promo code GBR. And we're back. Fellas, I think we could listen to the radio listen? On Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Yes! That's awesome! Back into it, Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. We welcome in Mr. Blackshirt, Charlie McBride. It kind of feels like a Monday, the day after the 4th of July. Coach McBride, uh, were there a lot of booms going off at the, the lake? How, how was your 4th? Good. It was good. Family and friends and lots of food. And uh, I think I'm growing sideways. <laughs> I, I i'm with you there i had uh, a lot of steak over the weekend and i had too much homemade ice cream last night i was in bed and uh and right down for the count so uh i didn't shoot any fireworks off did you guys make oh. it sound like uh there was a, a a civil war going on man how was the uh, the firework display well we actually had our fireworks on the second Oh, which was okay. uh, Saturday, and uh, the the lake here puts on a pretty good show, and then they went on afterwards, you know. And of course, each year are the people around in our little area here that we're close to, we kind of pooled the money and blew the joint up. <laughs> <laughs> so was the uh, was the cleanup pretty hectic, or, or was there? Was there help involved with cleaning up all the fireworks? I I didn't clean it up. I made the pyromaniacs clean it up. Well, good for you. That's uh, (laughs) that's the way to do it. I'm sure the tone was was pretty pointed (laughs) about uh, hey, you lit it, you clean it. I love it. Well, that's that's why you bring that's right. That's why you bring children (laughs) to the Fourth of July celebration. You just give them a broom and say, "Hey, man, go at it, (laughs) go at it." Well, I'll tell you what. All I know is that the, the the garbage man usually gets here about eight thirty on Monday. Uh-huh. Well, he came today because of the holiday, uh-huh. and he had already dropped one load that he had so many things. So there was a lot of people around that filled up that truck, and and of course he never got here till afternoon, some at one or two o'clock. Mm-hmm. So it was, uh, you know, it. <laughs> It, it was a lot of garbage and a lot of fireworks stuff. I know our, we had a ton of fireworks leftovers, and so that's where that came from. But it, it was it was wild. I mean, Saturday night was actually the forest was kind of quiet. Hmm. 
Well, it's not been quiet for the world of college football with USC <laughs> and UCLA <laughs> making a move to the Big Ten. What do you think of that? Well, I think we just took over the whole United States <laughs> from coast to coast, it looks like. Well, it looks like what they're headed to do is I, I think they'll add some more teams. Mm-hmm. I think they're going to, you know, have uh, – they may end up to, with 10 or 12 teams on each end. Sure. And uh, and, and then you won't go out of that league, uh, I don't think. Maybe you go with one game or something like that. But um, but that looks like, you know, it's kind of a good way. Cause it, it probably is going to minimize a little bit of the travel, okay. you know, for east and west. Uh, I think, you know, believe it or not, I think it will save a lot of money as far as having to travel to the east coast uh, to play Rutgers and Maryland and so forth and, it may not be. We're in the middle of the country, so it's probably going to balance out with UCLA and SC. Mm-hmm. SC but uh, it it looks like it's going to be a really a, a good conference, a tough conference, and some pretty high quality teams. I think so. You guys played UCLA a lot. What do you remember about some of those ball games? Well, I, I, you know, a couple of them. I think that, uh, that we 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 should have won. We lost, and a couple we shouldn't have won. We won. Hmm. <laughs> okay. You know, I mean, it was one of those deals. And they, but they they they're going to always have a good football team because they have a lot of good athletes out there. Uh, and in the and the in the recent years, uh, because of the pandemic and so forth. A lot of the players in California have moved on to the toward the you know moved east. Mm-hmm. Now I don't think that's going to happen anymore. I think they're going to see the conference and see that they're going to be playing in the you know one of the best conferences in the country, if not the best. And um, I think it's going to be a, probably a rewarding thing. It's probably going to open up a little more. Uh, California probably will open up a little more for everybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, it'll be it'll be a war, but it'll be uh, you know interesting with how money is being thrown around outside. I think they're going to make some rules over that. You know the new the w- new way of number one transferring and number two of the kind of money you're making. It'd be some rules. Yeah, they'll have a a chance to have a better governing body here with this new world of college football a quick thought on usc and lincoln riley he left oklahoma for the pac-12 well that landing spots turned into uh to the big 10 how do you see his offense surviving in the big 10 oh i I, you know i think he's gonna do well i he's a good football coach and he's sound and uh, I think he's the kind of person that can recruit. That's that's the that's the biggest thing. He's the, I think he's a good person, and I think that he'll, you know, he'll be able to do a good job of recruiting out there. And if they get to a point where they're stable and you know get, get, get aren't changing coaches as much and things like that, I think a little bit like we were. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they're gonna, you know, they'll they'll be tough. But UCLA and SC will always be fighting each other out there, no matter how you cut it, both on the field and in in recruiting. Mm -hmm. So, Coach, uh, a thought here about where else the Big Ten can go. What's uh, What's your perspective on Notre Dame? Do they finally join the Big Ten, or do you think they somehow keep the ACC together? Yeah, I don't know. I think you might see a couple of more teams from the West Coast come. I think you're, you're looking at possibly even going back with Colorado and going back with uh, Oregon, mm-hmm. possibly. And I, I've always thought Utah is a, is a good draw. I think a lot of it would depend on maybe the size of their stadium and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, I think that's going to add a little bit. But you know. <laughs> With the, getting in that conference, you can always add a few seats. I'm, I'll promise you that. You know they'll have they'll have some money, and uh, so what? You know it'll it'll turn out there'll be some good football teams. It's the the thing I 
My question was what's going to happen to the rest of their conference. Washington, I don't know what they're, what they're, where they're going to end up standing. But, you know, it's, but there's some teams that are pretty good that could, you know, join the Big Ten out that, that way and in between. Well, you might have a merger between the Pac-12 and the Big 12 because the Big 12, I don't know if the Big 12 would be able to pluck some of the other Pac-12 teams or vice versa. Maybe they just end up merging. That'd be kind of a cool conference. Yeah, well, that's that's, that's the way it rolls, you know, and you know, I've always I, – I don't think some of the schools uh, get enough credit. I, I know that Air Force isn't going to be a a total power, but to play them is tough business. Mm-hmm. I mean, and they, they, you, they could – whatever they whatever they do, uh, whatever conference, which would probably be in the Pac-12 more, more so, and uh, they'll, they'll – you know, they're a school that you don't want to play necessarily because of the option game and the things that they do that are different than most most teams. Uh, I think Arizona might pick up the sticks too and uh, some, you know get 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 better. And uh, you know, I think they need to get some stability like a lot of schools do, and I think they will. Coach Charlie McBride's with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. And, Coach, if we just zoom out a little bit here, a big-picture question. When you look at all this conference realignment, potential 20-team super leagues, <laughs> do you think it's good for the game of college football or bad for the game of college football? Well, I think the way they've got it, the way they've got it you got two leagues in one almost. You know, if you, if you end up and you could see 24 teams in the Big Ten, I mean, and 12 and 12. Mm-hmm east and west and then play each other in the end of the year that would be quite a game i mean that and then if you throw in the national championship on top of that you got a lot of pretty good football you know ahead for everybody uh it'll it'll be a little inconsistent i think uh you know the big ten even though you know i i smell the same thing a little bit that i did was when I came to the, uh, you know, when I came to the Big Eight, which was Oklahoma and Nebraska every year, and of course it's Ohio State, Michigan. It looks like every year here, and I think some of that stuff with a, with a conference when you get top teams and you don't have those practice games, or you're going to start out with a, you know, you're going to start out the season with a league game probably. Mm-hmm. And uh, so you know, it could it could be, that could be a big thing in the in the conference. Some teams start slow, and if you do, uh, UCLA, for example, I always started slow because they were uh, they were on quarters, mm-hmm. and, and a lot of times they were at the beach for about three or four games, <laughs> you know, and then they didn't figure it out. And after that, they turned into pretty tough stuff. Coach, going to switch gears and talk a little bit about the uh, the middle part of the Nebraska defense, the linebacking core. You've got uh, Henrich, of course, uh, in the inside, and Reimer, and Nebraska's got some depth and some, some options behind those guys. But talk to me a little bit about just the importance with Nebraska's defensive setup and how key – those inside linebackers are for this defense? Well, I think the number one thing is, uh, you know, you have to look at nowadays, of course, a little bit more throwing mm-hmm. than probably we saw, although we got teams that threw the ball more more so. But I think the speed factor is really, really, really important, uh, especially at that position because in some cases, uh, you know, you if you don't have guys that can cover certain people, you're going to have to switch and go to a nickel and a dime defense and change personnel a, a lot more, you know, and, and put defensive backs in there. And, uh, you know, that, that's something that, that we, we I don't know because I don't know the personnel mm-hmm. and the speed factor well enough to tell you. Uh, but I think that's a big thing, and and how they how they play on air, and they're going to have to play the run too. And 
you know, and then, of course, that was what we had to do. Like what you hear? High-quality radio and podcast is part of what we do at Hale Varsity. Hey, it's Chris Schmidt with Hale Varsity Radio, and I wanted to offer listeners of the Hale Varsity Radio Show podcast $10 off the price of an annual subscription. That means that you can get everything we do, 10 issues of our monthly magazine, our annual football yearbook, and all the premium content we produce at HaleVarsity.com. Just go to HaleVarsity.com backslash subscribe and enter in the promo code GBR for $10 off a full year of Hail Varsity. That's HailVarsity.com backslash subscribe promo code GBR. And now, and now back to Hail Varsity Radio. Back in on a Tuesday here as we continue our conversation with Coach Charlie McBride uh, here at Coach Charlie uh, discussing the linebacker position at Nebraska, the types of guys he recruited and what works in the Big Ten. Back into it, Hail Varsity. Our only real linebacker was our middle guy who kind of rolled the whole inside game mm-hmm. uh, primarily and, and, and had what we called a hole, which was, you know, 12 to 15 deep and around in there and, you know, with crossing people and stuff like that sometimes. And so, you know, you looked at some of that uh, uh, kind of stuff, but we really, really went after the speed. And I, I don't see any times with a lot of these kids who are recruiting. Mm-hmm. You know, I, you know, you see a lot of wide receivers, and and there are a couple of guys that pop up to you. But, you know, I, I remember at Arizona State, Frank Cush was a guy that he really believed in hurdlers. Okay. I mean, he had a he had a thing about guys that were athletes, that, and he felt like the guys that were really the athletes were the guys that were hurdlers and could could fly. And they ended up being our receivers. Most of them came up were hurdlers in high school. Well, that's uh, that's quite a hybrid ask that you wanted for your linebacking core to be tough enough and physical enough against a a, a power run game but also fast and agile enough to, to get that running back or slot in coverage or, or tight end. Well, that's where your defensive line comes in. You can't, if you, if you don't have a strong defensive line and if they're not doing the best they can, mm-hmm. they have to play their position, but they also have to try to keep people off the linebackers. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a big thing that nobody really talks about, but, you know that's why your hands and your eyes are so important in this game uh, nowadays. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of there's a lot of collisions inside. But the important thing is, as you see, is the cutback and adoption football and all those things you have to have to learn to play. And uh, we had even though we didn't play option teams every week, we had a 10 minute option period every day that we had you know practice except for Thursdays well quite a quite a list of middle backers you had Ed Stewart Phil Ellis Doug Coleman Carlos Polk uh Jay Foreman I know Jay kind of played in uh, outside and inside but uh Johnny Hess you guys had a good crew there to to play the middle for you right and, and you know those guys were smart and 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 tough I mean and, and, you know, I know that uh, Carlos has been in the NFL now for I don't know twelve, ten or twelve years mm-hmm. coaching, and uh, you know, I, you know, John Hess was a heck of a player that he didn't he didn't get that I don't think he got the recognition that he deserved. Uh, you know, as you go, a damn Kroger either I, he, he was with a three four more, but. You know, there were some special guys that could, you know, be your middle linebacker that we had. When Jay Foreman came up, he was special because he actually could have played, you know, our Sam backer easily. I don't know about Will, but, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if he had had good speed. But, uh, you know, it's just hard to tell now. But we had some guys that were – I think the biggest thing was is they're – not only were they good players, but they were smart. Coach Charlie McBride's with us here, and, and Coach, probably one time for one last thought here, and uh, I want to get your take on, on just how the linebacker position has changed through the years. I mean, 
I go back and watch football games from the 70s and 80s and even early 90s, and I look at these linebackers, and they look completely different with now how linebackers have to emphasize coverage and playing from sideline to sideline. Uh, do you think there's a, a superior method of linebackers? Is that just the way football as a whole has changed? Well, I think this speed thing is the biggest thing that's, that's probably changed the game since, you know, the time. When, you know, when you look at guys like Butkus and some of these guys in the NFL that were really good players, you know, you see a lot of big guys that could strong, fast, but they weren't fast like they needed to be, and they are now. I mean, you you look at how they how much speed has changed the game, and I and I my thing was the same thing as the, what pros are trying to get to a little bit is not have so much personnel changing, you know that they have because of the change in offensive sets and everything where they have to try to match up all the mm-hmm. time. So they're going to a lot of – you're seeing a lot of smaller linebackers in the in, in, in pro football as you did – as we did. We we went to defensive backs, really. Uh, uh, you know, Eddie Stewart and some of those guys were – you know, they were defensive backs when they came to Nebraska. And, you know, <laughs> when you read behind the scenes, now Eddie was – if he could have played safety – and he could have. He could have been a strong safety easily, but he would have been a starter. He would have been a backup player maybe for a year or two when he could have been a when he was a starter for three. I, I marvel at Butkus. You, you mentioned a name that got my eyes perked up a bit, and just how big and physical he was. And watching his his film, uh, you know, on the NFL films where. He was as mean and nasty as he was getting the running back. He is equally just pretty deadly smacking people uh, in coverage. He was just kind of a rare, rare combo, wasn't he, a size and speed? Uh, a linebacker that almost seemed ahead of his time. Bigger, yeah, so huge. He's one He's one of those guys like he was George Andrews a little bit. He was kind of silent but deadly, <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, a lot a lot of these guys look like Alder boys, and then you get them in a game and hang on. You know, I know if you if you ever met Pat Engelbert or talk to him, you think well, he's not a football player, but you put him in a football game, he'll knock your socks right off. The old pride and, of Norfolk, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you know, so you know you can't tell. You got a bunch of academic all Americans who, when you put them on the field, they're you know, I think some of them needed a doctor. <laughs> they, they have the on and off switch. That's important. <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> Charlie McBride with us. Coach, have a great rest of your week. Thanks for making time for us. And go uh, go get some, uh, some relief for, from the heat and humidity in that lake, all right? Go get myself a couple of popsicles, and I'll be bad. I'll be good. There you go. Coach, you take care. <laughs> okay. Thanks, guys. I'll talk to you later. Bye now. Good stuff from Coach Charlie McBride today as uh, hitting uh, a little bit there at the end, uh, his experience recruiting linebackers at Nebraska, and that's uh, so crucial on a day like today whenever uh, Nebraska is uh, getting news of the commitment of linebacker Dylan Rogers uh, from down in Texas. So some good insight there from Charlie McBride. Uh, also today discussing the commitments of both uh, O'Marion Miller and Barry Jackson, both those uh, guys wide receivers uh, of different types. As we discussed earlier in the show, Barry Jackson, 5'11", uh, got that speed factor as for O'Marion Miller, six foot two, has got that big body. If, if you missed any of uh, that conversation, that's what we let off the show with. You can catch that in podcast form. Hail Varsity YouTube page, iTunes, uh, Google Play, Spotify, really wherever you like to get podcasts, you can check that out. Uh, We also heard back in hour one from Mitch Sherman as he discussed the wide receiver position as a whole at Nebraska underneath uh, the Scott Frost era. And uh, then a little bit earlier this hour, we had uh, Jeremiah Searles join the show as uh, Searles hit on USC, UCLA, as well as the Team Jack Golf Classic. All those interviews posted up now, ESPNLincoln.com, and I'm uh, getting Coach Charlie McBride posted up as well as we speak to you, so that should be up here momentarily. We'll wrap up a Tuesday edition of Hale Varsity Radio coming up after the break uh, right here on uh, ESPN Lincoln for our local listeners and also across the state. Like what you hear? High-quality radio and podcasts are just part of what we do at Hale Varsity. I'm Brandon Vogel, Managing Editor. I wanted to offer listeners of the Hale Varsity Radio Show podcast 
$10 off the price of an annual subscription. That means that you can get everything we do. 10 issues of our monthly magazine, our annual football yearbook, and all of the premium content we produce at HailVarsity.com. Just go to HailVarsity.com slash subscribe and enter the promo code GBR for $10 off a full year of Hail Varsity. That's HailVarsity.com slash subscribe, promo code GBR. Sus. Come here, brother. Give me a hug. Bring it in for the real thing. We're on call for you. Catch the podcast at HailVarsity.com, the ESPN Lincoln app, or download them on iTunes. Saddle up, partner. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. One last time on a Tuesday, it is Hale Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Elijah Herbal taking you through the last couple minutes of this show as uh, Schmitty uh, off watching the well, the not so little guy. He's uh, he's on the mound tonight uh, in uh, one of the final Legion games of the year. So Schmitty checking out the show here just a couple minutes early as uh, he is on his way out to the ball fields uh, watching uh, the little guy hopefully throw some strikes tonight. So uh, good luck out to the Schmidt family. As uh, Carson finishes up his first year of Summer Legion Baseball in the few games left, Schmitty, I got to take that time to go out and watch the little guy pitch. What I want to do with this last couple minutes of the show is give some appreciation to one of the greatest athletes, at least one of the most dominant athletes of our generation. And yes, I'm talking about Joey Chestnut. I am not sure if you can actually define Joey Chestnut as as a true athlete in the the sense of the word, but in terms of the preparation, these competitive eaters have to put into it. I'm going to let it slide on a day like today, Joey Chestnut. I'm going to call him an athlete and based on his 15 wins, of the Nathan's hot dog eating contest. I think it's fair to say one of the most dominant athletes of our generation. If you can describe him as such. And we have some comments out from Joey Chestnut today. There was a lot made on, on social media yesterday, both of the fact that Joey Chestnut got his 15th championship in the Nathan's hot dog eating contest on one leg. Uh, that was huge as uh, he came into this uh, injured, played through the pain, and uh, got the title anyway. But the, the bigger deal yesterday was the protester or, or demonstrator, whatever you want to call him, who hopped on stage with Joey Chestnut and uh, hosted a sign which said, Expose Smithfield's Death Star. Um, and uh, Smithfield's Death Star is apparently a, a, a packing plant or something like that, uh, where, uh, I mean, Nathan's gets their, their pork from Smithfield, so he's trying to protest that, and Joey Chestnut, who's focused on the competition, if you haven't seen the video, go check it out, it's all over social media, Uh, uh, he puts the guy into a headlock and kind of throws him to the side and continues eating his hot dogs as he took down 63 yesterday, and we have a a quote out here from Joey Chestnut today uh, saying, I was just confused, I didn't know what was going on, I thought maybe somebody fell into me at first, He, he moved it more in front of me and it just happened really quick. And he went on to say that whenever he saw this crazy kid in front of him, realized what was going on, he didn't want to drop the hot dogs in his hand. He wanted to keep the hot dogs going. He wanted to continue eating while he dealt with this guy. So that's why he went with the, the headlock. No usage of the hands. It's all in the arms, and you can keep those hot dogs closer to the mouth. So Joey Chestnut tossed him to the side, continued on, and got his record 15th Nathan's Hot Dog Eating uh, Competition championship crown it was a big deal for joey chestnut and that's uh, one of my favorite things i know it's uh some people it's, it's hit or miss the nathan's hot dog eating contest but for me it's not the fourth of july without it and uh, it's great to see joey chestnut just uh, a legend in that game i uh, take home his 15th championship well, that'll pretty much do it for he- us here on a Tuesday edition of Hail Varsity Radio. If you missed any of the show today, again, check it out in podcast form. Hail Varsity's YouTube page, uh, or as well as Google Play, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you like to get your podcasts. You can also check out individual segments, our interviews, ESPNLincoln.com. All the interviews from the day should be posted up already, so go check those out if you haven't already. And uh, we'll talk to you on a Wednesday edition of Hail Varsity Radio. Jim Walden coming your way tomorrow and also uh, plans to talk with Barry Jackson, uh, one of Nebraska's newest wide receiver commits. That's all coming your way on a Wednesday of Hail Varsity Radio. A Huda Media Production.